The question we ended the last video with is when a pollution tax is imposed, the it's true that the firm, the polluter, sends the checks to the government. And so on a superficial level, it appears that, well, it doesn't really appear. It's the case that the firm pays the tax. But economically, does the firm really bear the burden of the tax? If the firm can increase the price of its output, then consumers, the people who buy the firm's output, are going to bear some or maybe even all of the burden of the tax. So briefly, I want to discuss this idea that firms pass on tax increases to their customers. And this general topic, as indicated in the upper left-hand corner of the screen, is called tax incidence. So let's suppose we have an initial situation as indicated with supply and demand. We have a certain initial level of output, call it Q1. It turns out that what a tax increase does is to make the supply curve shift in exactly the same direction that the supply curve would shift if the firm's costs were to go up. Because in some sense, the firm's costs are going up. And what that means is that you have a parallel shift vertically up in the supply curve. Now, the supply curve is not shifting up. It's, that, it's the best, I think, the best verb to use to describe it is that the supply curve is shifting back. So the new supply curve, we call it, uh, if, we, if we call the initial one S0, then, the, yeah, let me call it initial one S1. Let me call this S2. And it's important that geometrically, this is a vertical shift by the amount of the tax. So T is the tax. Now, T is the, well, uh, actually, it's a tax rate. So S2 is, is vertically shifted above S1 so that the vertical distance between them is T everywhere. What I want to do is drop a line. So the old equilibrium is here, the new equilibrium is here. I want to drop a line from the new equilibrium to the old supply curve. And mark the old price. And the new price. Here is the new quantity. Unsurprisingly, you put a tax on a good. The amount of it shrinks. And the price of it goes up. Hmm, the price of it goes up. So that means consumers see a change because the tax has been imposed on the firm. The tax hasn't been imposed on the consumers, but the price goes up. And so the consumers end up being hurt by the tax. How much are they hurt? Well, per unit, they're hurt by the amount to which price has risen, which is this amount here. I'm going to call that C. C stands for consumers. But you'll recall that the vertical gap between the two supply curves, S1 and S2, is the amount of the tax. And so the length of this line is the amount of the tax. Of 
that amount, the point indicated that by the letter C and its bracket actually ends up getting paid by consumers. The only social group left to pay what's left over are the firms. So F stands for the firms. So this turns out to be the way that you conduct a tax incidence analysis. And you show that indeed, in general, the firm doesn't pay all of a tax increase itself. It does pass on some of those costs. Now, to what extent it does, the book indicates in on page 173 in, in panels B and C of box 12.4. I'm not going to ask you the, those questions on an exam, but basically it's a question of how steep is the supply curve, how steep is the demand curve, and when the demand curve is really steep, that means that consumers are very unsensitive to price, and then it turns out that more the tax gets imposed on the consumers than when consumers are very sensitive to, to price. Um, so let's talk about, um, the, the next topic is, who are these consumers? And to what extent is it a bad idea to impose a tax on them? So the question is, is it fair to make the customers pay? Most economists would say yes if the customers are identical. But if the customers are non-identical, then there are distributional considerations to be brought into account. We say that the distributional consequences are regressive if it hurts poor people more than rich people. This is proportionally. So if a if it costs a poor person ten dollars and it costs a very rich person ten dollars, that's distributionally regressive even though the absolute amount of money is the same, ten dollars, because ten dollars constitutes a larger proportion of a poor person's income than of a rich rich person's income. So when you make the decision about whether to call something distributionally regressive or not, we're looking at proportion of income, not total dollar values. It's a policy is distributionally neutral if it takes the same proportion of income away from all of these consumers. And it's distributionally progressive if it takes a larger proportion of richer people's income than smaller uh, than poorer persons' income. And Typically, if an economist cares about the income distribution and, and prefers more equal to less equal distributions of income, then the economist would be troubled if the effect of this pollution tax would be distributionally regressive. Also, I should make a quick note on page, it's page 177, paragraph 2, line 3, your textbook authors use, without explaining, the acronym VAT. So VAT is value added tax. In lots of European countries and also in Canada, they don't use sales taxes, they use value added taxes. In the United States, if a if a a, a wholesale uh, business sells something to another wholesale business, so it's not the final consumer. So, like if a farmer sells wheat to a grain mill, a grain mill f sells wheat to a bakery, they don't have to pay sales tax on those transactions. But in Europe and in Canada, they do, and it's called a value added tax. And they pay tax on the amount of va value added. So the when the 
grain is sold, let's say, from the flour mill to the bakery, the tax is imposed not on the entire amount of money that the bakery gets from that that the flour mill gets from the bakery, but just on the difference between that and the amount of money that the bakery had to pay the farmer in order to get the grain in the first place. So it's it's on the value that the bakery added to the grain, not on the value of the original grain. And if a product goes through several different steps before it gets to the final consumer, then at each one of those steps, it's just the value added by that stage of the production process which gets taxed. As a result, when you go into a store in, let's say, Canada, and you see a price saying that something costs $1.50, then when you go to the cashier to pay for it, you'll actually be asked to pay a dollar and fifty cents, because there's no sales tax. Instead, the value-added tax is the way that the government has collected money. And so, people who are used to the value-added tax system get surprised when they come to the United States and find out that if if an item costs a dollar and fifty cents on a shelf. Then, when then the cashier asks you to pay, you know, a dollar and fifty six cents, and uh, and because they're not used to sales taxes. All right, I think that's. Um, let's see. I think that's all I'm going to say about this. There's um, one more topic in this in this chapter, which is international problems. Uh, and uh, we'll do another video on that.